God bless you as you're seated tonight. It was to a very primitive group of people in a very primitive time in history. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you to do, and lo, I am with you always. Brothers and sisters, I'm convinced tonight that until the great co-mission becomes the great go-mission, we have committed the great omission. I'll never forget the night that I was awakened out of slumber on an airplane, coming back from a faraway trip. And almost instantly, it was impressed in my heart, these words I heard the Holy Spirit impress upon me and say, as I was director of world missions for this denomination, bring to the attention of this denomination that this denomination known as the Church of God, this movement, known as the Church of God, can be, should be, and must be a leading participant in finishing the Great Commission. How audacious is that thought? To think that we could be a part of completing the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to take the gospel around the world. To some, that seems filled with audacity. To some, it seems lofty in the high hopes of a dreamer. But Jesus had that dream. Jesus had those hopes. And Jesus had that belief that it would be done. Because when he gave the Great Commission, he fully intended that one day it would be accomplished. He knew that the people he gave it to could not do it, but they could start it. But he also understood that the gospel of this kingdom would be preached in all the earth as a witness unto his name. And then the end would come. And on that airplane that night, the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to me that the church of God must partner with others. Can we do it alone? Absolutely not. But we must partner with others to be a part of Great Commission ministry. And the Lord spoke to my heart that night, and he said, we must find the unreached. Tonight I present to you that what has been the finished challenge for the last two years in Church of God World Missions must now be embraced globally by the Church of God, including North America, as the finish commitment. It's one thing to be challenged by something, but it's another thing to be committed to doing it and completing it with the help of the Lord. And engaged in this ministry, focused on the words of Christ. And I present to you tonight that involved in the finished challenge is this acronym that I want to invite you to help me build a dream on and a vision with. The letter F stands for find. We must find the unreached. And to finish the Great Commission, we must find the lost and the disenfranchised, including unreached people groups around the world, engaging them in love and winning them to Christ. Two years ago, we set as a goal that we would reach 250 people groups. Of the some 7,000 people groups that are in this world, we said we would reach 250 of them by the year 2020. But just this past year, 
through the ministries of our unreached people groups coordinator, Ken Anderson, and those who are working with him. A network of foot soldiers have moved throughout this world, and I've received a report just this week that we have engaged with and connected with, not 250 by the year 2020, but 380 unreached people groups just in the last 12 months. Somebody needs to praise the Lord. The next letter is the letter I, and that stands for intercede. We established two years ago that we would engage World Missions Ministry in one million hours of prayer just for the harvest. And I began to take that message around the world where I would travel, asking people to just add one minute a day. We called it the miracle minute in World Missions, just adding one miracle minute a day to their already established prayer time after they have prayed for everything and everyone. Would you just add one more minute at the end of your prayer and pray specifically for the harvest? You begin to write in, you begin to text, you begin to email and call, and you were subscribing to our one plus one initiative of prayer, one minute of prayer, one minute of devotional time that we had set up on our websites and live streaming. And as I began to travel the world, I met with global leaders like Dr. Nico in Indonesia. He looked at me and tears streamed down his face and he said, I am so thrilled to hear of this initiative. And we sat in a hotel restaurant and he looked at me with tears streaming and he said through a translator, Brother Hill, I can inform you that Indonesia will do that and more by themselves. I went to South Africa and they told me the same thing. I went throughout Latin America and they told me the same thing. And what was announced as a one million hour initiative of prayer every year has literally become multiple millions of hours of prayer that's going up before the throne of God in behalf of the harvest. And we participated in it again here tonight. The next letter is the letter N. That stands for network. Our stated goal for our networking vision is that to finish the Great Commission, we must network servant leaders of all generations, including pastors, ministers, and laity for shared ministry engagement. A mutual friend of ours by the name of Dr. James Davis has coined this statement, and I want to use it here tonight. He says, if you're not networking, then you're not working. And I want to encourage all of you that sit here tonight to increase and enlarge your network. None of us can do anything alone, but when we join with others, our power is made exponential, and our resources are exponential, and our ability becomes increased and exponential. And I believe that the networking opportunities for Church of God ministry around this world are indeed phenomenal. The next letter is the letter I again, and it stands for invest. The stated goal is this, to invest the Great Commission, to finish the Great Commission rather. We must invest our resources by strengthening the church through strategic partnerships for care, church planning, education, leadership development, and discipleship. Thank you, Dr. Tommy Propes, for receiving that offering tonight. I must tell you, brothers and sisters, that church planning must become priority with the Church of God again. I appreciate what Brother Propes brought to our attention tonight. I appreciate the measure that was passed first in the ordained bishops' council and then today in the General Assembly session that we will establish a church planting funding bank to help young men and young women plant churches. I appreciate the fact that the Executive Council has given $100,000 for the last several years to our church planning efforts that World Missions has been given oversight of. I appreciate the fact that I'm sure a very generous offering has been given tonight. But can I step out on a limb from a tree here and tell you that I believe that bank already exists. And I will not be happy until out of the basic budget 
of Church of God tithing and income that comes into international offices, we are able to designate at least $1 million a year to help young men and young women around this world and in North America plant churches to the glory of God. I will not be happy until we can do that. We must invest in a young generation and help them fulfill their ministry. The next letter is the letter S, and that of course stands for sin. To finish the Great Commission, we must send disciples to all nations, actively sharing the gospel through the Holy Spirit empowerment. And then, of course, that leads us to harvest. God is a harvest God. The Lord Jesus Christ is passionate for the harvest. I hear him say in my spirit, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And to finish the Great Commission, as a vibrant movement, the Church of God must commit now to reap a world harvest with a global church focus on the Great Commission finish. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you tonight, it is possible. It is possible, first of all, because I believe it is the will of God. It's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and know the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's also possible because there is a global move of the Holy Spirit in this earth today that is empowering every age group and every nationality, leading us, drawing us closer to one another in unity and in the bonds of peace so that we can work together to fulfill the Great Commission. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work in this world today. I believe it's possible because of what I'm seeing in that the mission field has become a mission force. There was a time when North America, maybe some other countries in the world were sending missionaries to places. But I'm telling you as I've traveled around this world, I can testify that missionaries literally are going globally from all over the world. Latin America is sending missionaries everywhere, even from China now. Missionaries are going around this world to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that every one of you will become a missionary tonight, a missionary in your local church, a missionary in your hometown, a missionary to your family, and proclaim the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone that you meet and everyone that you see. The mission field has become a mission force. I believe that it's possible because technology is available today that we've never had before. We've experienced that here this week and especially tonight as thousands of you have shared the message of the Great Commission prayer that we prayed just a few minutes ago. And can I tell you, brothers and sisters, the internet belongs to Jesus Christ. Technology belongs to Jesus Christ. And it's time that the Church of God locally and nationally and internationally take advantage of the technology that God has given us. But it's possible to finish the Great Commission, I believe, in our generation and in our lifetime because there is a student movement around this world. Everywhere I have traveled, I have seen it. I'll never forget an experience I had one night in Mexico after I had preached and I had given an invitation for those who wanted to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly the stands begin to empty in that large stadium and the, the field, the playing field was full of people crying out to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I begin to focus on the audience and it dawned on me that most everybody that I'm looking at is under 30 years of age. Thousands of them speaking in unknown tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. I went to Germany. The crowd wasn't that large, but, but experientially the power was the same and even stronger because I saw young people that night in Knebus, Germany at ETS begin to pour out their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moved down in that auditorium. I have traveled through camp meetings all summer long and I've been excited to see students all over this nation in North America pour out their heart to God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you the young people of the Church of God are hungry. The students around this world want to be involved in Great Commission ministry. And I'm here to tell you tonight the power of the Holy Spirit is available to this young generation. And because of the hope that I have in the student movement and the young generation, I believe we can finish the Great Commission in our lifetime and usher in the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This much I know. 
This much I know, time is too short to wait too long. What we do, we must do quickly before Jesus comes. We can do it because we're anointed. We are the anointed body of Christ in this earth today. Earlier this week, I was moved with a passage of Scripture that I want to share with you tonight. It surrounds the story of the Lord's death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's found in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, beginning with verse 57. Let me read it for you. And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded that the body be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Among the descriptions of the church that we find in the Word of God, one of the most frequently used and well-known phrases to describe the church is the word body and the phrase the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 15, the Apostle Paul said, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. In Ephesians 5 and 30, he said, We are the members of his body. In Colossians 1 and 18, he says it again. He is the head of the body, and then he identifies that body in calling it the church. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 27, he said, now ye are the body of Christ. In Ephesians 1 and 23, he said, the church is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 2,000 years ago, someone came to Jesus and said, can you show us the Father? And to that, Jesus said, have I been with you so long that you have not seen the Father? He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, if someone were to come into this convention center tonight and ask us, can you show me Jesus? Can you show me Jesus in the earth today? We should with confidence be able to stand up and proclaim that when you see the church, you see the body of Christ in this world today. For while indeed we are not Christ, we represent Christ to this hurting, lonely, hungry world because he reaches through our hands, he walks through our feet, he embraces with our arms, he, he looks through our eyes, he loves through our heart. We are the body of Christ in this earth today. In saying that, I will also say that the spirit, or at least the attitude of Joseph of Arimathea is upon me. This man by the name of Joseph was identified as the Lord's disciple. He was not among the twelve. He was one that somewhat followed at a distance. But when none of the other twelve could be found when Jesus died on the cross, it was Joseph who stepped forward. This man of means, this man of finances, this man of influence. And when none other disciple could be found, this distant disciple moved himself close to the dead body of Christ hanging on a cross. And he said, I can't ignore what I see. I cannot turn my head away. I will use my influence, I will use my finances, I will use everything within my power to give that precious body on that cross a decent burial. He did not want to leave the precious body of the Lord subject to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the prey that would come and desecrate the body any further than it had already been desecrated. So the Bible said that he went to Pontius Pilate and he begged for the body of Jesus. 
One translation said he interceded for the body. Another one said he prayed for the body. Another one said he intervened for the body. And he begged to do something with the precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, I have come tonight as well to beg for the body of Christ. If indeed the church is his represented body in this world today, somebody needs to do some begging. If indeed this church is his represented body to this world today, the display of who Jesus should be to this world today, somebody needs to do some begging. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, I'm not too proud to beg. I will tell you, brothers and sisters, I'm not ashamed to beg. I've come to stand before my brothers and sisters in the church of God around this world and tell you it's time somebody pray for the church. It's time somebody intercede for the church. It's time somebody care for the church. I've come to beg for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and cry out and say, Oh, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again that your people may rejoice in thee? Somebody praise him in this house there's something about the demeanor the attitude of Joseph of Arimathea that speaks to me tonight several things that get my attention if you'll allow me to use this story as a pattern for what I believe we need to be doing first of all when Joseph came to minister to the body of Christ on that cross after Jesus had died and all others had gone away Joseph understood the urgency of the hour. You see, it was approaching Sabbath, and it was also the Passover. And Joseph understood that if he was going to have time to get the Lord's dead body off that cross, get that body in a tomb, roll the stone over the door, and then participate in Sabbath and Passover, he would have to move quickly in order to fulfill the laws and the regulations that surrounded Passover and Sabbath. Because to touch the flesh of that dead body would bring contamination to him and possibly disqualify him for participating in the Passover. He had to work with haste. He had to move quickly. He had to climb a ladder to get Jesus off that cross, get Jesus to the tomb, and before all of that, get permission from Pontius Pilate before the sun went down in the afternoon. If he did not get it all done before sundown, he would have disqualified himself from participating in the Sabbath and in the Passover festivities and celebration. He knew that he had a small window of opportunity in which to work. He understood that the night was coming when no man could work. That's why he had to work while it was day. He understood the urgency of the moment, the urgency of the times. Can I ask you a question tonight, my friends? Do we as the church of God really have a grasp on how critical the times are? Do we really understand how urgent the times are? May I say to you that we are living right in the middle of Matthew chapter 24. I read just a few days ago to refresh my memory of this experience. Jesus and his disciples were walking near and around the temple area. They were mesmerized by its grandeur, mesmerized by its beauty. One of them spoke up and said, Lord, tell us, what do you think of this place? How, how do you see the beauty of this place? Jesus stunned them with these words when he said, there's coming a time when not one stone of this place will be standing atop of the other. And he just kept on walking in stone silence. He took them as far as the Mount of Olives. And when they got to the Mount of Olives, they broke the silence by asking the question and saying, Lord, can you tell us when these things will be? And then Jesus began to paint a picture. He said, there's coming a time of great deception. There's coming a time of famine and pestilence. There's coming a time of war and rumors of war. There's coming a time of, uh, uh, of great distress of nations within the earth. There's coming a time of martyrdom. But then he gets down to verse number 13, and he said, but you need to hear me. You need to understand what I'm about to tell you. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved, and the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the earth as a witness for my name's sake in all of this world. I need to tell you we're living right Right in the middle of Matthew chapter 24, the distress of nations, the calamities that are going on around this world, 
the chaos, all that's taking place, do we really understand how urgent these hours really are? That's why every prayer has to mean something. Every sermon has to mean something. Every song has to mean something. Every general assembly has to mean something. We don't have time to waste time. We don't have time to get lost in our politics. We don't have time to get lost in our meaningless competition with one another. We don't have time to give ourselves to trivial things that have no bearing on eternity. I came out to tell somebody in the Church of God General Assembly in Nashville, Tennessee, it's high time that we come back to God in revival because these are urgent hours. Jesus Christ is soon coming for his bride. Somebody praise him in this house. Oh, I just felt the Holy Ghost come by then. Raise your hands and give him praise, somebody. It's time to lay down our selfish ambitions. It's time to lay down our meaningless, selfish agendas and get on his agenda. It's time to ask him what his plan is. It's time to ask him what his will is. These are urgent times. Pardon me if I get intense. Joseph understood the urgency of the hour. But then there's another stirring, meaningful moment to this story. When Joseph came to minister to the body of Christ, the Bible said that he wrapped the body in a clean linen cloth. That says to me that he understood the importance of wrapping the body of Jesus in purity. You see, Joseph had been observing something that had been happening all day. They had desecrated the Lord's body. They had decimated the Lord's body. He had been somewhere near enough to hear the sounds of the whips as stripes were laid upon his back and the cat of nine tails literally tore chunks of flesh out of his back. Possibly he had been near enough to watch somebody ball up their hands into a fist and smite him as he was blindfolded and then say, prophesy to us and tell us who did that to you. Maybe he had been near enough to watch some wicked man plait a crown of thorns together and place it upon his brow. And the long, hard thistles of that crown moved deeply and embedded themselves into our Lord's precious face and his brow, making his blood mix with his sweat and stream down in the filth of that moment. Possibly he had seen some Roman soldier lean his head back and gather his filth in his throat and propel it out upon the precious face of Jesus in his spittle. Maybe he had seen him fall beneath the weight of that cross. And as he was lying there on that road, maybe he had watched somebody kick dirt into his face. Possibly he had been near enough to hear the thud of the hammer as it pierced nails into his hands and into his feet, and he watched them pierce his side with a spear. He'd heard the mockery. He had heard the slander. He'd heard the ridicule and the criticism. And now he's ready to minister to this body himself in a different way. And he attaches that ladder to that cross. But as he climbs that ladder, he has draped over his arm and over his shoulder a clean linen cloth. As if to say, Lord, you've been through enough today. I didn't come to make it worse. I've come to make it better. You've been slandered enough. You've been criticized enough. You've been ridiculed enough. I didn't come to add to the dilemma. I didn't come to add to the problem. I came to try to bring healing and purity to what has been a very filthy, dirty scenario. He brought purity to the body. And the Bible said he wrapped the body in a clean linen cloth. I have the attitude of Joseph on me tonight, brothers and sisters. I have come tonight to do my best 
to wrap the body called the Church of God in a clean linen cloth. The body of Christ has had too much slander. The body of Christ has had too much ridicule. The body of Christ has had too much criticism. The body of Christ has had too much infighting and backbiting. The body of Christ has had too much of this to endure. And I've come in this little message that I want to preach tonight to do my best to wrap the body of Christ, represented by the church of God in this place tonight, in a clean linen cloth of holiness. Oh, can I preach on holiness just one minute? Sister Anna Ruth did a marvelous job preaching it last night, and it stirred me up. I need to preach a little bit about holiness. We must wrap the church in holiness one more time. I came by to remind somebody that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is still God's standard of living for his people. Somebody better pray for me. I got preach on me right now. God never told me to raise the dead. God never told me to walk on water. God never told me to turn water into wine. There's a lot of things that Jesus did that God never told me to do, but there's one thing that he did tell me to do. He said, be ye holy, even as I, the Lord God, am holy. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. We need to wrap this body in the purity of holiness. We need to wrap this body in the purity of reconciliation. You have called upon me tonight to tell you the truth. You have called upon me tonight to shoot straight with you, haven't you? Will you permit me to do that? I want to tell you one thing that I fear tonight is that instead of the church infecting the world, the world has infected the church. This unusual political season that we're in, in the United States of America, unlike anything I've ever seen or known or heard of in my lifetime, I'll just tell you with all sincerity and with all love and compassion, I fear that that same attitude and that same spirit has moved into our church locally. It's moved into our church nationally. It's moved into our church internationally. I came by to tell you that is not God's will. That is not God's purpose and plan for this denomination. It is God's will that we prefer our brother. It is God's will that we be humble one for another. It is God's will that we return back to humility and obedience so that our mantra becomes that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death. I want to know him. We must wrap this body in the ministry of reconciliation. We've been called to restore our fallen brothers and sisters. We have people that are not here in this general assembly that were here or with us at least two years ago in Orlando. But since then, they have fallen and they have hurt themselves and their reputation and their credibility with others in ministry. But it is not our job to cast them out. It is not our job to shun them. It is our job to pour in the oil and the wine, as Paul said in the book of Galatians, restore such a one, keeping your own self in mind as if it could happen to you. I wish you'd reach over and slap somebody on the shoulder and say, he's preaching to you tonight. The longest day I'll live, I'll never forget what Dr. Williams led us into Tuesday morning. I wrestled with you with that, Dr. Williams. I knew it would be a challenge. I knew it would be a difficult thing for you to do. Because I can't tell you a church I've been in in a long time that had feet washing. And let me tell you who I had the privilege of sitting by. I had the privilege of sitting by the man that for the most part worked in the basement of general headquarters for over 40 years by the name of Charles Hollyfield. Anytime you go down into his office in that basement, you would see his ordained bishop license hanging on a sign. But his ministry was to keep the air conditioners going and to keep a team of people working and cleaning and repairing and fixing 
and keeping our ground spotless and immaculate so that when you come to visit us, you can be pleased and proud that your church of God has something like that as a witness and a testimony. And I had the privilege of getting on my knees and taking his precious feet in my hands and washing the feet of this dear man of God who pastored a small church in Cleveland, Tennessee, but worked in the basements and the hallways, keeping maintenance going, the maintenance ministry, the support services of the church of God. I came by to tell you, whether you have a towel in a basin, whether you have a tub full of water, I came by to tell you, at least in prayer, at least in spirit, at least in attitude, at least in duty, we need to wash one another's feet on a regular basis in the church of God. We've got to wrap this body in a clean linen cloth again. Holiness, reconciliation. Reconciliation among races. Reconciliation among generations. If God has moved me with anything in four years that I've served world missions, and I heard Dr. Griffiths allude to it earlier today, my heart has been pulverized. My heart has been ripped in two and put back together and ripped in two again as I've traveled around this world and I've seen men and women that never asked the question as Sister Diaz said last night, how much is the salary and what does the parsonage look like and what are the benefits? but they've given themselves to ministry literally all over this world of every race and of every skin tone. I came by to tell you we have precious brothers and sisters around this world and for us to take on any kind of a haughty attitude that says I'm higher than you or I'm better than you, that is a sin in the eyes of God. I came by to remind somebody that the ground is leveled at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name and you can do the same. The ground is level at the foot. My God, I feel you. I came to wrap the body in a clean linen cloth. I clean came to wrap the body in a clean linen cloth of doctrinal purity and Pentecost tonight. I came by to tell you I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto the salvation of men. I came to encourage somebody preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and authority. I came by to stand up for the preacher again. I don't care what your style is. I don't care what your approach is. But when you stand up in a pulpit, you better proclaim the truth of God's holy word rightly divided. Oh, I got to wrap this thing up. But I came by to tell you it's time for us one more time to dedicate ourselves to the truth of God's Word and proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit and the power of Pentecost. You're looking at a Pentecostal preacher tonight. I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I'm not ashamed of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. I'm not ashamed to praise Him. I'm not ashamed to shout. I'm not ashamed to celebrate. I'm not ashamed of my Pentecostal heritage. Pardon me while I shout just a minute. I just felt the Holy Ghost come by and touch me right then. Would somebody raise your hands and praise God? My God, I feel the Holy Spirit in this house. Wrap the body, wrap the body in purity. The attitude of Joseph is, is upon me tonight. Sit down, I'm not through. I'll try my best to speed it up, but I'm not through. Oh, I'm going to preach. I've done found my zone now. The attitude of Joseph is in my spirit tonight because when I read this story, here's what I see. When Joseph came to minister to the body of Christ, now listen to me carefully. When he came to minister to the body of Christ, he realigned the body. He had a realignment assignment. He took the body of Christ out of a death position 
and he repostured the body into a position where that body could receive life and resurrection. The Lord had been suspended between heaven and earth, nailed to that torture rack we called the cross. He had to be. He had to be. He said, for this reason came I into the earth. I was born to die. They tried to keep him from it, but he rebuked them and said, for this reason came I into the world. He had to die. But once death had been accomplished, it was time to reposture the body to receive resurrection. And Joseph retrieved that body off of that cross, and he repostured, repositioned, realigned the body of Jesus in his own tomb, hewn out with his own hands. I want to tell you, every time you preach, you need to preach toward realigning the body of Christ. Singer, every time you sing, you need to sing toward reposturing the local body of Christ in your church. Let me tell you why I'm here tonight. Because I've come to help this body called the Church of God get in a posture for revival. Let me tell you why I got on a plane for the last four years and touched down in over 100 nations of this world, traveling over 550,000 air miles or 550,000 air miles going around this world. I did it because my heart says, help this body get positioned for revival. Oh, I, I'm preaching like I'm angry. I'm not angry. I'm just intense. I'm really tired of singing dead songs, praying dead prayers, preaching dead sermons, giving worship to a God we act like is dead because of our dead worship. I'm not talking about stylistics. I'm talking about the content and the composure of your heart when you come into the presence of God. I want to tell you tonight that it's time, it's high time, I'll use that phrase again, it's high time that we reposture and reposition the body of Christ to experience revival. You see, Joseph understood something. I, I don't know that he had a full comprehension of it, but he understood something about the concept of the third day. I think he had been nearby enough to hear Jesus say some things about the third day. Maybe he had been nearby enough and close enough to hear Jesus say, you can destroy this temple, but in three days I'll build it again. And maybe he thought that's interesting. How can that be? Possibly he was in the vicinity somewhere when Jesus told the story of Jonah and the whale, and he said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for, for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. But he will return, he'll be resurrected. I don't know that he knew everything about that. But he understood something's going to happen on the third day for this man. And whatever I do, I've got to get him postured for the third day. Whatever I'm up to, whatever this is about, it's got to happen before the third day gets here. He worked with anticipation of the third day. Can I tell you, I also work and I also preach tonight in anticipation of the third day. The Bible tells us that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. We've already had two millenniums. We've already had two days. And around 16 years ago, we stepped into our third day. And can I tell you what I anticipate? I anticipate that any moment, that any time, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken my mortal body and your mortal body and raise us up. I came by to tell you we are on the threshold of the third day. And with the third day, there's a third day anointing. And with the third day, there's a third day resurrection. And with the third day, there's a third day message. With the third day, there's a third day power. I came by to help this church get realigned for the third day outpouring of the spirit that is coming upon the church of God. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. These are the days of the outpouring of the spirit of God. Somebody give him glory in this house. 
Somebody raise your hand and shout, revive us again, O oh Lord. Say it again, revive us again, O oh Lord. Oh, raise your hands and give him praise. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's in this house. Reach over and touch somebody beside you. Pray for them to receive this impartation of the Holy Spirit right now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Oh, let your praises swell. Let your praises ring forth. Oh, my Lord, there's a, there's a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit blowing in here. Praise Him, somebody. Praise Him, somebody. Praise Him, somebody. Praise Him, somebody. Oh, Lord, I can't stop this just yet. L lift your hands and praise Him. Lift your hands and praise Him. Let me mention just one more thing to you about Joseph of Arimathea. When he came to minister to the body of Christ on that cross, he understood the urgency of the hour. He wrapped the body in purity. He realigned the body to experience revival. But my friend, he also came as an anointer to the body. The Bible tells us that he and Nicodemus came and brought ointments and spices to anoint the body of Jesus. No doubt some misread the prophetic implication of that. Some would look at it in the typical sense and say they've come to anoint him for burial. They've come to anoint him to lay him away so that possibly sometime we might have a memorial service and we can just walk by and remember who he used to be and what he used to do and what he used to have. As I look at this carefully, it comes into my heart tonight that those spices and those ointments were not so much about anointing a dead body as they were anointing a body that still had a future as prophet, priest, and king. I've come to anoint the body of Christ tonight. I didn't come with criticism. I didn't come with slander or rebuke. I've come to anoint you with the words of my mouth. I've come to anoint you with the word of God. Oh, I've just, I've, just, I've just got to preach what I feel. You see, there's two kinds of people in the world, and there's two kinds of people in the church. Don't let me offend you. This is not my intention to offend you. But you have anointers, and you have embalmers. People that follow you around embalming you with their critical words and their attitude and their spirit. People that will stand up and preach on major media outlets and embalm you with their false interpretation of Scripture and the Word of God to supplement their cause and their purpose. I didn't come to do that tonight. I came to anoint you. I came to anoint a young generation that's been crying out to be used in service of God. I came to anoint the women of the church tonight that's been crying out to have more of a role of influence and active ministry in the church. I don't have all the answers. 
I don't understand how we get from point A to point B of wherever we want to get, but I do know one thing, wherever we get, we get there by the word of the Lord and by setting down together, reasoning together with one another, knowing that everything we do will be based on Scripture and a mutual understanding and respect for one another. I came to anoint you. I came to anoint my brothers and sisters from the five regions of this world that World Missions has been involved in. I came to celebrate you. I came to say thank you for being sacrificial. Thank you for being willing to serve. I came to anoint my brothers and sisters in North America who have largely sponsored and supported world missions around this world to the tune of $118 million in the last four years. I came to anoint you. I have no criticism for you. I was at one of my lowest moments several years ago and I was looking for encouragement. I had been sent to Oklahoma as a state overseer and I just entered into a zone of anxiety and even oppression because of dealing with so much difficult issues. And I just went around everywhere looking for encouragement and I couldn't find it. Paula said one day, why don't you call the executive committee? I said, they sent me here. I can't call them and tell them I'm in trouble. And it seemed like everywhere I went, I was getting anything except encouragement. This is the truth. I showed up at an independent tent revival one night, incognito. No coat, no tie. Got me a metal folding chair and set it on the back row toward the tent pole and just sat there to watch the program. Before I knew it, I'd been called down to the front by the evangelist. And he instructed me to raise my hands, and I raised my hands. And he said, Yea, saith the Lord. And when he said that, he got my attention. I thought I was about to get a word. He said to me, This sickness is not unto death. I mean, I'd been a little depressed, but I had no idea how terminal it had become. <laughs> and then he looked at me and said, and yea, yea, saith the Lord. Now listen, one yea is significant, <laughs> but two is earth moving. He looked at me and said, yea, yea, saith the Lord, thou shalt not die as long as you live. I said, thank you, sir. I turned around, went straight to my car, and went home. And I failed that night trying to find anointing. This really happened. I went to the state office the next day. Anybody from Oklahoma is here tonight. You never knew this, but I went to the state office the next day. And I'm sitting there, and I don't feel like making a phone call. I don't feel like writing a letter. I don't feel like doing anything except leaning back in my chair with my feet up on my desk, staring out the window. When I saw this older model Lincoln Town Car come in my parking lot, and I watched this guy park that car that looked as big as a boat, And he got out of that car, and he had a Bible under his arm about three times as big as this one I'm holding. And he stormed down the sidewalk. I heard him when he came into the front door. And in a few seconds, the secretary buzzed me and said, there's a man here who wants to see you. He says he has a word for you. My first thought was, after that word I got last night, I don't need one today. 
I said, I'm not expecting anybody. I don't have an appointment. I said, who is it? What's his name? She asked him his name. He told her. She told me. I said, invite him back. I'll see him. A man that I had never seen walked into my office with that Bible, and I invited him to sit down. And when he sat down, he took his chair and he scooted it up close to my desk. He said, I don't know you, but early this morning at about 4 a.m., I was awakened out of a dead sleep by the Holy Spirit, and he said, go to Oklahoma City and find the bishop of the church of God in that state and tell him something. I kept waiting on him to say, I want a church or I need some financial help or something. I said, what do you have to tell me, sir? He took that big Bible and he began to open it up. And he went from one side of it to the other, and he said, I just want to read Scripture to you, sir. He said, let me start in Jeremiah. He said, thou hast been ordained a prophet to the nations. I didn't feel like a prophet. I hadn't felt like a prophet in a long time. But he said, from your mother's womb, you have been ordained a prophet to the nations of the world to carry the gospel around this world. He said, while I'm in Jeremiah, let me read this one to you. Jeremiah 29 and 11, he said, God knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you, thoughts to do you good and not evil, to give you a hope and a future. And he just kept on reading. I'm telling you, he went from one side of the Bible to the back of the Bible. He said, here's one I need to read to you. When you walk through the water, the, 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 the waves will not come upon you. The, the fire, the, the, the flame will not kindle upon you. He kept on reading. He said, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. He kept on reading. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He kept on reading. And when he got through reading, he said, now can I pray for you? He took out a little vial of anointing oil that he had in his pocket, and he took the top of that, and he just put a little dab of oil on the tip of his finger, and I allowed him to reach over and touch my brow with that oil. And when he touched me and he began to pray, the Holy Spirit broke in. And he moved me and he broke that oppressing spirit that had come upon me because of all the criticism and the slander and the ridicule and all the words that had been poured into me by negative people and negative sources. And I was anointed that day. And as the body of Christ, we are called to anoint one another. Stand with me, please. I've got to stop. I'm calling on the church of God to lead this general assembly and move all over this world with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and anoint the body of Christ. Wherever you find it, every town, every city, every hamlet, every village, anoint the body of Christ. Anoint your pastor. Pastor, anoint your laity. Anoint the body of Christ. I've received instruction, I believe, of the Holy Spirit of what to do in this altar service, this altar time tonight. There's a large crowd here this evening. It will take some effort. But I'm going to ask you to leave your seats and just move in as close as you can all around this stage. All around this stage. Just begin to move in. Everybody that will, would you please come? Just come stand. Just come stand. Sing it one more time, Brother Danny, while everybody's walking down.
listen to me. All over this assembly floor tonight, there are people that need to be anointed. There are pastors here tonight. You came to this general assembly depleted, struggling with difficult issues. You need to be anointed. There are church leaders here tonight and state overseers and youth and discipleship directors and others. You've struggled for months back in your regions with difficult things, legal issues, spiritual issues. Satan has even attacked your physical body. You need to be anointed tonight with fresh oil. There are some of you here tonight, you've walked around these hallways this week and the business sessions and the worship sessions at night. You found it hard to concentrate in worship because of all the conflict going on in your mind and there are difficulties and struggles on every hand. You need to be anointed. I'm gonna ask you tonight to raise both of your hands. Oh, Holy Ghost, come. Holy Ghost, come. I'm telling you, I believe the Lord has already shown me what's about to happen here. There's about to be a breakthrough in the Spirit. There's about to be a breakthrough in the anointing. With your hands lifted, I want you to repeat these words with me. Lord, I give you these hands. Lord, I give you these hands. Put fresh oil in my hands. Put fresh oil in my hands. Put fresh anointing in my hands. So that I can anoint the body of Christ. And now, Father, whomever I touch with these hands, may that anointing come upon them. The anointing to serve. The anointing to encourage. The anointing for the Great Commission. Anoint my brother and my sister with my hands in Jesus' name. Now, listen to me. I want you to turn and I want you to take those hands. And I'm going to ask you to put them on the side of the faces or the heads of the people that you're standing by right now. Turn to them in the name of Jesus as if your hands were full of oil of the Spirit and anoint somebody with the touch of your hand. There it is. There it is. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Be anointed with fresh oil. Be anointed with fresh oil. Be anointed with fresh oil. With fresh oil. Hallelujah. 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 Be anointed in the name of Jesus. Be anointed in the name of Jesus. Be anointed in the name of Jesus. Sing it, Danny. Sing it, Danny. Sing it. 
I'm about to let you go. Got two or three announcements I need to make before I do that. But before I do that, I got a song in my soul. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. one more time and while we sing I just want to give him a wave offering a wave of praise I just want to pray I, I want to close this assembly in a few minutes with a praising church going out the doors here praising him for revival praising him for the outpouring of his spirit praising him for the anointing to engage in great commission ministry well he abides he abides In just a very few days, you will be hearing about quantitative and qualitative goals that are connected to the finished commitment. I believe God has brought us to the hour of the finished commitment. I'm asking every state overseer, I'm asking every pastor, every evangelist, to believe with me that we can be a part of this movement to finish carrying the gospel around the world.